Hey, there you go. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We are a little late, very late, actually, to no fault of ours. Unfortunately, I think you guys are all dealing with um, the load shedding at the moment. So thank you for everyone who has joined. And tonight's discussion is how to improve sperm parameters. And we are discussing this. We're chatting to Robin van Staden, and she is an embryologist at Genesis. Um, so I know we've been, it's, 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 um, we're already late and everything, but I think this is a very good topic. And we're actually going to hear from somebody that, that deals directly with, with the, you know, when it comes to IVF and dealing directly with the sperm. So more on the scientific side of things tonight. Um, and it's, it's great to hear from someone who's actually dealing with it and can give us a, a, a scientific aspect or, a, sorry, a scientific, um, look on this um an understanding of it sorry understanding of it so thank you for everyone that's joining us and um i'm going to invite robin now and um let me just see Let's see there we go i'll invite you just give it a few minutes for robin to accept. here we go hi robin <laughs> So tonight's been a bit crazy, but we did it live. We made it. We made it. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people. I, I think it will affect also the amount of people that we're on tonight because everybody's got load shedding at the moment. Um, so I'm glad our turn is done for the evening, I hope. <laughs> and I hope yours doesn't start soon as well. Um you. I'm supposed so to thank you very much for doing this and and um, you know being willing to discuss this with us and, and give us a more of your insight a scientific insight on um, you know sperm parameters and that type of thing so I'm going to get straight into it what parameters are measured in normal semen analysis okay so when we do a classic semen analysis we are going to check the volume, the consistency, the pH of the sample. Then obviously we're going to get, under, get it under the microscope. We're going to look at the concentration as in how much sperm is there. We measured this by millions per milliliter. And to some of the newbies that come into the fertility world, they're always like, oh, that's so much. But, you know, yeah. sperm is like fox, like um, wolves. They hunt in packs. You need a lot of them to fertilize an egg. So we look at that. We look at how many are swimming. We want to see at least 30% plus that are swimming. We want to see how many are alive. Um, there will always be dead sperm in the sample, but ideally we would want more than 50% of them to be viable or alive. Um, we also need to see the morphology of the sperm. So the morphology and the DNA content inside that sperm head are pretty much the most important factors because we can work with low concentration and poor motility, but morphology and DNA content are really the most important ones. So I like to tell the patients that we check how many of the sperm are good looking. And, you know, the World Health Organization tells us we need at least 4% in a human sample that need to be normal forms. And it may seem quite low, but like I said, yes. we're looking at millions per milliliter. So there are quite a few that will be good looking. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are plenty of other things that some labs may do. So they would check reactive oxygen species. They would test the fructose and the ejaculates and all of those things. It would depend where you go and, you know, how advanced the center is, how many embryologists or andrologists they have and the equipment that they have. And all of these things yeah. can add value to your treatment, but they're not always necessary. Um, when we do a typical semen analysis. So that's generally what we're looking for when we do a sperm sample. Okay. Um, and so for those who've joined, because I see quite a few has joined while we're busy talking, um, Robin is from Genesis Fertility Center, am I right? 
and she's an embryologist at Genesis. So we, we're looking at more the scientific side of things tonight with an embryologist, and she's explaining about how to improve sperm parameters. So the next question we have is, what kind of abnormal values do you see most commonly? Okay, so we have to bear in mind we are looking at a subfertile group of patients. Um, so the most common abnormality that we see would be poor morphology where we could have a relatively normal count, something above 15 million, and good motility, but there's poor form. So the head of the sperm could be like elongated, it could be too big, it could be too small. And, um, you know, that does impact fertility, fertilization, and embryo development. So morphology is really, really important. And it's very closely linked to, as I said before, the DNA content of the sperm head, which is vital in the entire process. Okay. And then um, are there treatments or supplements available to treat these different abnormalities? I think mean, this is quite a big one because, um, you know, that's the first thing that gets asked, like what can I take to increase? And it's difficult to, to, to answer that with a lot of people, with a lot of clients. So this is the, the biggest question is, you know, the, usually it will be the wife who says, you know, my, my husband's sperm sample was poor or this was wrong or they weren't enough that were swimming. What can I do yeah. about it? Can he drink this pill or that pill or the other thing? And, you know, there isn't really a pill that can fix something like that. There are supplements and, um, you know, like any doctor will tell you when you're trying to improve your health overall, it will always be the same thing. It will always be, you know, a good diet, um, something, especially for sperm now, something that's high in antioxidants. So, you know, he should eat a lot of food that's rich in zinc to help the prostate. He should, if he's going to take supplements, he should look for something that's containing, um, selenium, vitamin C, vitamin E. Um, I think coenzyme Q10 is a new one that they've seen actually does help improve the volume, which in turn will improve the amount of sperm that we have to work with. So yeah. there are things that can help, but they won't make a drastic change. So if you've got someone who's got a very, very low count and a very poor morphology, it's not necessarily going to overnight increase all of these things but it can help so there's no harm in doing these things but there is not really a lot of scientific evidence to say that you know if you drink vitamin c your husband's sperm is going to turn into these little supermen um it just yeah. it just doesn't work like that your your genetics are what they are of course there yeah. are surgical interventions if there is a problem so yeah. if we have an ejaculate where we say, okay, you know, there's a lot of elongated forms and um, poor morphology, DNA damage, then mm. your fertility specialist might say, look, you know, this is something I really think a urologist should address. He would do a physical exam and he may discover something like a varicocele, which would increase yeah. the pressure in the testes. It would increase the temperature in the testes. So it may affect the morphology and it may affect the way that the sperm is swimming. And it can be treated relatively easy with um, surgical intervention and those kinds of things. So there is treatment, there are ways to improve it, but there isn't something that's a miracle cure. And we all yeah. wish, you know, I could just drink a pill and then everything would be okay. It's just, it is unfortunately yeah. not that simple. Yeah. You know what, today alone, I had two calls from men. Um, asking about, you know, where can they go? The one was asking about where can they go to actually have um, semen analysis done. And the other one was someone asking what they can take. But what, what I'm getting from this is more and more men are coming forward where it used to be that, you know, men won't come forward, um, they won't speak about it or ask about it. And funny enough, it is in the, which I'm very proud of, is in the African culture. Um, I'm so glad that men are actually stepping forward and actually saying, okay, what can we do to help the women? It makes me feel so good. And I actually, like, I really try and, like, I'm going to help this. I want to help this person because it's for a man to step forward and say, um, you know, I think there's something wrong or how can I, can you help me? You know, because yeah. he's, he's helping his wife in the end of, at the end of the day, yeah, you know? It's a um, so it's really, really nice to be getting that. Yeah, I think a lot of the time, uh, you know, the men... <sighs> 
it's a lot to do with, and you know, I want to say the word ego, but I don't want it to sound like ego, yeah. but it is a big thing for them to, yes. you know, get these results and think, oh, well, there's something wrong or it's all my fault. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a big deal for them, but you know, the woman also goes through so much. She has to do all these injections and have all these horrible scans and these needles yeah. and, you know, the extraction and everything. It's really quite traumatic. And there yeah. are things that the men can do. I mean, obviously support their wives, but, you know, when the wives say, look, I really want you to stop smoking or drinking so much, or can you drink this vitamin C pill or these funny things that will increase your sperm count? Doing those little things, it, it may actually work magic for you know, for the woman's psyche as well. It really helps. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, there's got another question is, how do you attain the best possible sperm when you have a sample with these abnormal values? Okay, so luckily in the lab, this is the reason we do what we do. Um, we do have different techniques, different um, things that we can use to help us when we have these samples. So obviously if we're doing IVF, we're using a good sample, but if we need to turn to ICSI, then we need to use other methods. So if we have a patient that has poor morphology and possibly also a high DNA fragmentation index or DNA damage, then we're going to use something like a pixie dish, which some labs use. Some labs prefer to use something like sperm slow, which is, it's a media and it's actually quite cool. It's, um, it's got hyaluron in it. So what that does is the sperm heads have receptors, so they get stuck in it. And then it's quite easy for us to go and just select the sperm that's been stuck because we know then that it's the most mature and should have the least DNA damage or strand breaks in the sperm head. And that's really beneficial and it has been shown to result in improved fertilization and embryo quality. So what's also really great about eggs is that in younger women, they have a much better capacity to correct sperm with DNA damage. So even if your embryologist isn't always getting the perfect sperm in there, the egg is also able to do a whole lot of magic on its own. Um, so we wash sperm a certain way, we select sperm a certain way, and then the rest we have to leave up to the egg. And then we just hope for the best. We can't, I wish there was a supplement that people could drink just to make the DNA fragmentation or the reactive oxygen species go away because those things have a, have a big impact in the treatment and in the embryos. Well, um, you know, I, 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 I like making jokes. <laughs> so anyone that knows me, I can talk a lot of nonsense. And as you're talking, um, I, I'm hearing you, I'm thinking, even, even as, as a tiny little embryo and a tiny little sperm, the women are still, <laughs> the women are still, still actually in charge and helping the men find their way. <laughs> so, I know, it's, it's, maybe it's a funny thing, but... Um, no, you know, no, I mean, no. look at that. Look, egg, goes an egg is actually it's helping like the sperm. Instinct. Wow. Yeah. It's actually so awesome. Nature, women are always, yeah, we, we're just Sorry. always fixers. We like to fix problems. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so tell me, infections and antibiotics, how does that affect, how could that affect your sperm, a man's sperm? Infections, antibiotics, quite they can definitely impact sperm quite drastically. Obviously, if a man's had an infection recently, the most important thing is to determine, did he have a high fever? Because this is now seriously going to impact his sperm. It can decrease the concentration, the motility, meaning the amount of sperm that's available in swimming, and it can also impact the morphology. So if a man has had an infection we need to say okay it was a bad infection there was a fever where was the infection because if it was a urogenital something down there infection we definitely have to wait this one out now the biggest thing with sperm is it takes time it takes time so we have to wait out the whole process of going from you know the whole production of sperm so that's about 120 days it's three months which is difficult because nobody wants to put their fertility treatment on hold, but it is beneficial. So then we yeah. need to wait. We need to wait for a new regeneration process for there to be 
fresh sperm available that hasn't been affected by that infection. Yeah. In the case of antibiotics used to treat an infection, it also has an effect. If there was antibiotics specific for the urogenital tract, then it would have been quite strong antibiotics. So again, it can have a serious effect. Antibiotics con containing stuff like tetracycline are also quite toxic to sperm. So again, we have to wait 120 20 days for new sperm to be produced. And you could do a cycle before that time, but it is likely that you won't, you won't have desired outcome. You may have a poor cycle. So we want to avoid that. And we understand that patients don't want to wait. But at the end of the day, it may be worth it to wait. So yeah. big effect, big effect. And um, yeah, the hardest part of hearing that is that you have to wait three months before you can do anything again. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, it, it actually answers one of the questions that I had now is, Women are always saying, oh, um, let, me, let me abstain for at least two weeks before we plan anything, you know, before it's, it's that time for um, ovulation and things like that. But it doesn't really matter because, as you're saying, it takes 120 days. Yeah, so the abstinence is, is another thing. Two weeks would be a little bit long. So the World okay. Health Organization says to us that the sexual abstinence should be ideally no shorter than two days and no longer than seven days. If we go shorter, then we may get a very low concentration. And that's fine in men that have a good sperm count. But if there is yeah. a slightly lower sperm count, we want to give them about three to five days abstinence and then to produce the sample either for analysis, for freezing or for treatment. If we go yeah. longer than seven days, then we risk a high percentage of dead sperm or a very low motility, which is not great. Again, if he has a high sperm count, it should be fine. But if his sperm count is on the lower end and he's got some abnormalities, then we don't want to really test that. We want to stay in that window. Okay. okay. We've got a question from Nikki. Oh, sorry. Um... Lexi Brown, and she's saying my husband's count was to 245 mole and mortality 70%, but fertility doctor said advice to take sperm I approve because he smokes. Is there any other vitamins he can use? He hates pills and we're planning IVF. Maybe you can run through the list of, of vitamins again that you spoke about. Okay, I'm just losing you a little bit there. Um, I can see the question. Um, yeah. I think it's a sperm supplement or something. Is there anything he can take? Okay. So if, if your husband doesn't want to take a supplement, then still those general guidelines that I spoke about that any doctor will say to you would be, you know, regular exercise. Obviously, everyone's going to tell him to stop smoking. Unfortunately, yeah. it does have a huge impact on sperm. Um, drinking as well. If it's moderate, it can still impact the hormones in both the male and the female. So Drinking, not great. Not everyone's going to be a fan of that, but in moderation, it should still be okay. Definitely, you got to stop the smoking or at least try and decrease it as much as possible. Um, and then just, you know, try and introduce, if he doesn't want to drink pills, introduce foods that are rich in minerals, in antioxidants. Try and get him to cut down his coffee intake. Maybe convince him to have a cup of rooibos tea every now and then and those kinds of things. Awesome. That's yeah. a great one. I just want to check if there's anything else. Um, yeah, there's no one else. So thank you very much, Robin. I, I think you answered quite a few really good questions tonight. Um, again, apologies for everyone for being late because of low cheating. Unfortunately, we couldn't help that. Um, but thank you again for, for um, doing this with us tonight. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much, Robin. Bye. Bye.